All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined all the way across on the other side of the country from New Jersey, from Scott Schober. How are you doing, Scott? Hey, great to be here. Yeah, and Scott is a cybersecurity and wireless technology expert and author of multiple books um, around uh, cybersecurity. And today what we're going to talk about is keeping your small business safe from cyber criminals. So uh, let's get straight into it, um, Scott. So obviously the amount and the sophistication and the variety of threats have, uh, have increased exponentially. And for small businesses, this can be a real challenge. Yeah, and, and it's changed over the years. In the past, we used to read the headlines. We think back to the days of Target and Home Depot where credit mm -hmm. cards were breached and things like that. It, a lot of those tax attacks were very focused attacks and didn't really affect the general population and small business owners. But that has certainly changed. I think as hackers would pivot from those large attacks and, and obviously securities increased, now they look and they say, oh, I could target a small business. I could target a hospital or a municipality, and I can get a lot more return for my hack. So uh, I think just that fact alone has really woken everybody up, including myself running a small business, and, and really our backstory uh, predating uh, mm. the target hack and things like that back in 2013, we're selling security tools to a lot of DOD agencies and small businesses and even Fortune 500 companies. So it was kind of ironic when we were targeted and I had everything down the list compromised, everything from Twitter, credit card, debit card, our, our checking account, $65,000 were, were stolen out of that. And it became a federal investigation and paperwork and the list goes on and on and on. So I've experienced firsthand the pain and some of the things that I've done wrong, mistakes I've made or where I've been a little soft, I guess, in the security side, I've had to learn and implement practical things within my company. And I try to share that with others that, that I talk to often. So they too can have a stronger cybersecurity posture. The fact that now it's affecting really all of us. Yeah, yeah, and, and absolutely. And probably has been exacerbated too, because uh, obviously because of the pandemic, a lot more people are operating online and virtually and all that, which, and especially small businesses. And that has probably absolutely. opened up things. And, and probably maybe they even rushed there very quickly to do it. And probably security wasn't top of mind. Yeah, you make a really good point there because it felt like, at least for me, I remember the day I was at the RSA show, big security show uh, over in San Francisco, right when the pandemic was kind of unfolding. That was end of February, March of last mm -hmm. year. It, it still didn't gel with everyone. Even at the show, we're kind of like seeing people with masks, what's going on, this, this virus is spreading coming from overseas, what's, what do we do? Um, and then it felt like a switch change. And then suddenly everybody's going remote, People aren't shopping, aren't eating out, and everybody's almost like the, the world changed. It felt like to me in a matter of a, of, of a flick of a switch. So we've had to all of us adapt. Now we work through this pandemic because some of the products we make are, are, are critical. So mm -hmm. we were deemed by the government that we have to stay open and have to work. So we've been very busy, but we've had to implement a whole lot of safeguards. And one of the more challenging things to your point is Anytime there is people that are working remote, we have to up the game with security because a lot of times we're using our personal devices. A lot of yeah. times we have to access remotely into the main computer network at our company. So we have to do basic things like not just put in login credentials, but are we using multi-factor authentication? Another level of security, very important to keep us safe. There's many documented breaches out there over the past decade. And the number one culprit is people just from a third party trying to access remotely, that's how they get in the computer network. They're not using multi-factor authentication, which in most cases is, is in already there. It's embedded in the security. It's just people opt out of it because it's another step and takes a little bit of time. So I always preach to people balance between security and convenience. Very important to choose security where you can. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. And a good point that you raised there is obviously over the last while, the 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 way that once upon a time uh, all business kind of devices and, and and technology and all of that was kind of locked down and looked after by the business now you have the, we have this kind of strange 
kind of casual hybrid model where people use their own devices and they log on to things, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes, it, it, the more connected we are, the, the harder it becomes, especially for small businesses to try and keep everything secure when, when we have this kind of hybrid, kind of almost fluid model. Yeah, yeah, that is true there. So I, I think people had to, that have, have been able to pivot quickly in businesses and organizations, they're very successful. Those that did it by the seat of their pants, they struggled through it and, and were probably a lot more vulnerable and targeted by a lot of these cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the, um, what, what are some of the threats that uh, small businesses should be aware of and maybe perhaps aren't or perhaps have forgotten about? Because let's face it, I mean, you know, people often put security to the back of their mind because you know, you're focused on your business. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, a lot of times I start with sometimes the basic things mm -hmm. that we all say, yeah, 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 that's important. It's important, but we're not doing it. Uh, I'll give you the most simple, practical thing that really doesn't cost any money. It's just a little bit more of an effort. Something as simple as shredding documents with sensitive information on it. And, and, and case in point, uh, I share this story often. One day I had a credit card. It was expiring. So I simply took scissors, chopped it up in a million tiny pieces, threw it in my garbage. That was a Friday. Monday morning, I got a call from our building manager outside by where all the garbage is picked up because you got to come out here and see this. I look outside and it was a credit card. The card I chopped up all pieced together on the curb. So somebody was actually rifling through our garbage, saw a chopped up credit card, repieced it, probably took a photo of it and tried to go shopping. Fortunately, the card was already expired. Um, so I wasn't compromised in that case. But really what that did is it told me what lanes people will go to to steal personal information. So what do I recommend? A business spend a little bit of money and it's, it's under $200 for a micro cross cut shredder. You could put mm -hmm. CDs in there. You could put credit cards, debit cards in there and anything with personal information that you need to properly dispose of. If you buy the cheapie, there's a, you know, 20, $30 shredders that are almost giveaway ones. They do not make it confetti. They're not micro cross cut. That's what's important there. They, they usually leave long lines of paper. Yeah. It's good, but it's not secure. Why do I say that? Because you can easily dump it over, spread it out. And with a camera and an algorithm, it can actually repiece the paper together with a little bit of time and effort or a lot of time and effort, depending upon um, how shredded it actually is. So really, really destroying it is important. Micro cross cut sh shredder. That's just one example right there. Yeah, simple and that's just and that and that's a great big that's a great point because as you said, it's simple to do and it's just a it's just a discipline issue, right? After yeah. that is just making sure that you're disciplined. Um, what what are some other what are some other threats? Another one. I hate to say this because I hate this, and everybody I talk to hates it. Passwords, passwords, yeah. passwords. We all we talk about is these stupid passwords. Why? Because they're so easy to hack. They're hard to remember. It's hard to create a long, obscure password. So what do I usually recommend? Uh, a couple different schools of thought. And what do I do as a hybrid model? I take very sensitive passwords for critical things that are associated with stock or financial or company IP. And I actually do write it down in a physical black book, layers of security though. So that black book is locked in a safe, locked in an office, locked in a building with an alarm, camera, so on and so forth. So again, layers of security for that limited number of highly secure passwords. Beyond that, I use a password manager. And that's very important because what does it do? It disciplines you to go to one source and you have a master password, which is long and strong. Mm -hmm. And then all your passwords can be created to be strong, but you don't have to remember all these stupid passwords. That's a good, for me, that's a good balance because I've got well over 200 passwords to remember. So again, you have to look at your situation and then adjust using technology, but it's not always good to just throw all your eggs in one basket. That, that's my belief there. Passwords are yeah. a pain. They'll continue to be a pain for a long time coming, unfortunately. Yeah, and obviously then you, you would probably recommend that you probably should uh, you know, use multi-factor authentication whenever you can for anything that's yeah. uh, sensitive. That's a really good point. And, and, and if you are somebody that tends to use email, that's free and everybody does, when we look at the, the billions of users that use Gmail and Yahoo Mail mm -hmm. and Hotmail and many of the others that are free, ask yourself the question, what are you trading for that free email? Because there's always a trade. How do they make money from you? 
They don't just give it away because they're a nice guys, Google and mm -hmm. Yahoo and all these other companies. In other words, they look at the content of that, either the specific things or the metadata, data about data, and they use that to sell and target ads. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not like they're trying to steal the content necessarily that's inside of your email, but they're using that to leverage data to either sell it or advertise. So we just want to be conscious of that. And what do I say that for is because of all these large data breaches, such as Yahoo, if your email is compromised and you are sharing sensitive information, social security numbers, bank account, passwords, whatever, that information could get out there in the wild, end up on the dark web, the internet's underbelly, and now it could be sold to the highest bidder. So if you're going to use free email, realize that there's a trade-off, convenience for security, but at the same time, don't put down things that are private and confidential. And most of those, to your point, do have multi-factor, two-factor authentication. Use it. That will minimize the chances that you're compromised and hacked. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. I mean, as you said, I mean, it's a pain and everything, but at the same time, um, you know, it's an even bigger pain when you get hacked, right? Absolutely. Uh, what, um, what, what is probably one of the more, more surprising ones when you talk to, to businesses and you raise particular issues? What are the ones that surprise them the most? Oh, there's a lot of them, unfortunately. Uh, one, that, one that kind of really surprised me, I saw this firsthand, I've read about it before, but then I was walking through a business and saw it, and I was just kind of blindsided when I saw it and I had to stop and in my tracks. If you're familiar with credit card processing, they had a credit card machine there for processing mm -hmm. credit cards, swipe or put in the chip and pin, so on and so forth. But on the top of it, they actually had the refund pin, which scared me. And I said, wow. So Technically, somebody could walk up to that machine, they could take a credit card, their actual credit card, or enter a number in it, enter the PIN to refund, and refund themselves money <laughs> from the company. It's because it was out there in broad data, and now it was innocent. Another time I saw it where somebody actually took a picture of an office, and you could see the credit card machine, and it said refund PIN. So that mm. went out on social media. So sometimes yeah. we, we just don't think that if, if we take a picture or if we have it out in the open office and people walk by, it could be cleaning staff, it could just be your fellow employee, it could be a visitor, doesn't matter. But putting information such as pins, security codes, logging credentials out in the open, unfortunately, it happens far too often. I see it whenever I travel. And I usually remind people, said, hey, you might want to just put that away. I'm not going to steal it, but I just happen to notice that somebody else that's not very scrupulous might just grab that and, and take it, sell it, use it against you. So just raising awareness and being conscious of, of things that are proprietary, I think is very important. Um, another area that comes up again and again is um, the effective use of social engineering, where mm -hmm. these are things that people could be uh, duped or scammed out of information, but innocently. So somebody may call, and let's just give an example. This is very common, in fact, actually. Um, it, it's a law firm, or it, it could be something like uh, an accountant, and the receptionist at the front desk gets a phone call. Hey, I, I've got an urgent proposal. I got to send it over to Mr. Smith. He needs this immediately. I just need the password for the Wi-Fi so I could email that over to him. Mm -hmm. And she's frantic thinking, oh, no, this is a big proposal. I got to get it. And it, she's not thinking and breaking down that why would he need the password for Wi-Fi to send an email? But quick talking, sounding convincing, using familiar terms kind of breaks down any suspicion and you build trust with the listener over the phone or through the email. And that's how it often happens. So somebody that's doing an actual penetration test where they're trying to hack into a computer network, this would be a white hack, ethical mm -hmm. hacker trying to break into the company to find vulnerabilities. One of the single first things they do is they pull out in the parking lot, pull up their laptop, they place a phone call and try to get somebody with inside the company to divulge the Wi-Fi password. Mm -hmm. Once they get that, then they can move in, get into the computer network and work laterally and start garnishing information through the different computers. And that's often how it happens. So social engineering is a common conduit to get into a company. So what does that mean for small businesses, especially important to educate everyone on your staff? And I always tell people yeah. it's good, not just to the receptionist that might make a mistake, from the janitor to the CEO, everybody needs to be cybersecurity conscious. If they're aware of things, 
then they could stop it in the tracks. And, and, and that's really a, a team effort. So training is a big part of it. Awareness is a big part of it to implement these best practices so your company is not fooled. Yeah, no, it, it is. And it's amazing how sophisticated, how, how sophisticated yet simple some of this uh, social engineering is, as you say, like, you know, ca calling up with a, a rushed or panicked phone call, um, you know, basically appealing to the better nature of the person on the other end of the line to help you. Um, and so, it, uh, yeah, it, it, these are the kind of things that don't, you know, don't come naturally to people. I mean, you, it, it comes naturally to be helpful. So therefore, you have to un unfortunately curb their their helpfulness in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a good point that, that you make being helpful as humans. We want to help someone's mm -hmm. behind us. We want to hold the door open for them. Um, somebody asks a question, you want to respond. We want to help one another, especially during this pandemic and the challenges that we have. But again, we have to be guarded to a certain point and know when information is confidential or proprietary or sensitive in nature. And then we have to vet it. We have to double check a question. That's where another huge problem, in fact, one of the biggest problems now targeting a lot of businesses and a lot in the healthcare sector, not surprisingly with the pandemic, mm -hmm. is phishing scams. Where, where somebody will send in supposedly innocent looking email, and these are launched millions of them a day, and they get through the junk filters, and we've all seen them, we know what they're like. And, and years ago, it was the Nigerian prince is gonna give you, you know, $20 yeah. million. Those are not the scams we're getting much anymore. Now it looks like it's from our bank, or it looks like, oh, get your COVID shot, but you gotta respond right now, get in line, you know, so on and so forth, a sense of urgency. Uh, it looks very convincing. Just click on this link, and then oftentimes now they're going to provide you with some personal information about yourself and response when it's redirected to the website you go. So it may show the last four digits of your social security number. And they may even say for your security, you know, we're only showing this here. Please complete the rest of this, mm -hmm. your birth date, your mother's maiden, name, whatever the case may be. Now you just divulge something to a fictitious website. And the graphics they use, the verbiage, the spelling, all the tells in the past that we could identify a fake phishing email are really hard to find. And it's easy to spoof an email so it looks like it's from Bank of America because at the top it says Bank of America. So really have to be careful not to click on attachments inside of emails. Use caution, do your investigation. And when in doubt, I always encourage people, pick the phone up and call. Very important to yeah. do that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good piece of advice because, yeah, people do struggle with that still today, as you said, because these emails are getting more and more sophisticated. And uh, and let's face it, the, the temptation to click is always is always one it's that there. needs to be it's there and needs to be resisted. Oh, so so, Scott, what are some of the uh, the newer threats that you're seeing and, and where is where is what's the next wave of, of cyber criminal? What's what's their latest tactics? Well, I think what, what they've done is they've certainly refocused their efforts toward um, higher ransomware attacks. In, in the mm. days in the beginning, it was a ransomware attack, which might equate when you convert bitcoins is what's usually the digital currency that they demand. It was $300 to $600. Some of those attacks have, are still going on, but they're not as profitable because people have software to stop it. They don't want to pay it. They're resorting to the backup. But now when they're targeting a municipality, when they're targeting a hospital, they don't have a whole lot of time to negotiate a ransom. They hopefully have some insurance. They hopefully have a backup, but not all of them do. So what they do now is they drive the price up and they may demand $50,000, $100,000. In some cases, I've heard of a million dollars. So imagine if you're a cyber criminal and you could extort a million dollars out of a hospital during a pandemic with a ransomware campaign. That's pretty profitable. In, in contrast to you're having to get thousands of people to concede to paying you a couple hundred dollars when it's a very targeted attack through these phishing emails. So I think that's shifted and has become a much bigger problem. Again, we don't hear about it in the headlines all the time because what often happens is a, a municipality or a hospital or something else when they're targeted and they're hit with that and they do have insurance, the insurance company is gonna come in immediately. Most insurance companies where there's a cybersecurity policy in place already have a reserve of Bitcoins there. And instead of just saying, okay, you're demanding $100,000, 
equivalent in Bitcoins. We're going to pay you, give us back the keys to unlock this data so we can get back to business and saving lives. They're going to actually bring in a professional. That first thing they'll do is they'll look at the strain of malware for the ransomware, and they're going to see if they already have the decryption keys from a prior hack. If they do, they can unlock it, restore the system, quickly back it up, go back to business. They're, they're okay. If they don't, they can now negotiate and go back to the cyber criminals and say, look, guys, $100,000 is ridiculous. We'll give you the equivalent of $20,000 in Bitcoins right here, right now, if you guarantee that you'll hand over the decryption keys. Okay, boom. And again, they're criminals. They're not stupid. They're looking for fast money, and then they're going to take off. So that negotiation often happens to remedy the situation before it becomes public outcry, makes the headlines, and distracts the business disruption side of things could then kick in play. So that's what I see right now as a very, very serious problem. And it's interweaved with the whole pandemic and vaccines and everything else going on. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to think of it that the businesses are having to pay out and 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 actually negotiate with with criminals just in order to get back to business. But I guess, I mean, there comes a time for some businesses where you've got to, as you say, um, you know, weigh the opportunity cost of of yeah. of being out of business or being held to ransom for a longer period of time. Yeah, and I, I think it's important for all of us to realize, especially small business owners, looking at. There's all, an association often with cyber criminals working a scam with what's current topic. Right now, another thing besides the pandemic is what? It's tax filing time. Yeah. So for companies, for individuals, anything around tax time, usually a few months before and a few months after, cyber criminals are aggressively trying to obtain your e-filing number. Once they can get that, oftentimes they can produce a fake filing and hopefully get a refund and they could check back if there was a refund on last year's taxes and they can apply for a refund for this year, but taking your money and hopefully they get the refund. So they change the account number, do some other clever things. So we wanna really be careful, especially this time when it comes to tax information. That's when we talked about earlier, the importance of extra documents and things, don't leave them around, shred them or lock them up securely. So nobody, no prying eyes could see it. Nobody could slip by and take a picture of it or make a quick photocopy. And then later on, sell that information or try to, again, garnish and, and, and obtain personal information so they could hack and steal our money. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a scary world in many ways, Scott. Uh, but I mean, obviously, if, if you are uh, conscientious and just follow some of the, the simple rules and stay up on, on, on what's happening, I think you should be able to uh, navigate it. Um, so all of Scott's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, Scott, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm running a uh, wireless threat detection company that sells to many different cyber agencies, mostly DOD agencies, but also Fortune 500 companies. And we have a lot of tools that are used to stop the wireless threat. That's a huge conduit to get into companies also, the wireless threat be it at the gas pump, be it at the ATM machine, we have tools to stop cyber criminals from stealing credit card, debit card, personal information. And, and then also I do a fair amount of education, best practices I try to focus on to help small businesses, to help seniors, to help consumers, to help everyone just stay safe in the world of cybersecurity. Yeah, listen, this is fantastic. Yeah, and uh, and one of the uh... One of Scott's book is, books is about that, his new book, it's Senior Cyber Best Security Practices for Your Golden Years. So I would encourage uh, if you're heading into your golden years or you know people who are in their golden years, it's a good good investment because uh, the last thing you want is to see people scammed um, when they should be enjoying their retirement. All right, well, listen, Scott, thank you so much. It's fantastic information. Thank you. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.